Good to see so many people still here on a Sunday afternoon. Very nice. All right, so we're going to get started uh, to kind of break up what we normally do. We're going to do announcements now, and uh, I know that's going to throw some of you off, so be prepared. But we'll cover announcements, and then we'll pray, and then we'll continue with the, the cantata that's taking place this afternoon. A reminder, men, there is uh, the men's retreat. We'll be leaving on Friday for the weekend. And then uh, that means no men's breakfast in the month of May. So don't show up Saturday morning for breakfast. Well, you can't. You by yourself. It's fine. We'll have a work day on the 14th. Please show up, men and women and children, for the work day on the 14th. We'll start about 9 o'clock. And we'll go until, I don't know, noon, 1 o'clock-ish. If you want to stay later, you're more than welcome, uh, but we're going to try to get some things cleaned up around the church building and get some things looking nice, so that will be Saturday at 9 o'clock, May 14th, all right? If you have not uh, registered your kids for camp, um, whether it's the Wilds of New England or Tri-State Bible Camp, you need to get your kids registered to make sure they have a spot. So I'm saying that out loud for parents to hear, just in case the message hasn't been communicated to you from your teenage child, all right? So parents, register your kids. Get them all set up for camp this summer. Okay, uh, obviously, Wednesday night we have prayer meeting. I want to mention that. Uh, other than that, I think we're good on announcements. Let's pray, and then we're going to stand together to sing a song. God, I do thank you very much for the privilege we have of uh, gathering together, together again this afternoon. And I pray that this time would be for your glory, that you would receive the glory from all that is done, that it would not be for those who are singing or those who are uh, reading, but really the glory goes to you. We want you to be magnified. Praise go to you. You be exalted and worshipped. You are the one that deserves it. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to sing praises to your name. May it be a blessing and an encouragement to those that are here. May you keep those who are singing, help them not to be nervous or, or uh, scared in any way, but instead depending upon you for the strength and the ability to, to sing and to, to read. Lord, we do ask all this in your Son's name. Amen. Let's stand together to sing. You guys are going to participate. In the cantata, there are two times in which, uh, uh, sorry, I believe three times in which you will be singing. Uh, and so now is the first time. It's Rock of Ages. The words are here on the screen. It's either, um, you can use this, or it's 392 in the songbook if you want to use the songbook, okay? Rock of Ages. We're going to sing the first and the third verses. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flow be for sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for rest, foul I to thy fountain fly, wash me Savior or I die. Be seated. Not what my hands have done can save my guilty. Not what my toiling flesh endures can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can 
and bear my awful load. Thy voice alone, O oh Lord, can speak to me of praise. Thy power alone. Fun.
right. Let's stand together to sing. There is a fountain filled with blood. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the fourth. First, second, fourth. 309. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners blood I felt very awkward when I got to the well and found a man, a Jewish man, no less, sitting beside the well. And when he asked me to give him a drink, I nearly dropped my water jar. At first, I thought he must be mocking me. But when I looked into his face, I saw only kindness. We felt like we were defiling ourselves as we walked into Cyprus. It was disgusting to be forced to deal with such wicked people. When I finally found my voice, I asked this Jewish stranger what possessed him to ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. He told me that if I knew who he really was, I would be asking him for a drink. A drink of something he called living water, and that I would never thirst again. We were finally on our way out of Cyprus, headed back toward Jacob's well. Passing around a large loaf of bread, each of us broke off a piece. 
I was still a little upset with Judas. He kept the money for our small group, but he wouldn't pay for the money for the food himself. Judas didn't want you, that's actually to be Samaritan. I asked Jesus to give me some of this miraculous water so that I would never have to draw water again. Then he told me to go call my husband and bring him to the well. When I told Jesus that I had no husband, his response shocked me. He, Jesus told me that I had spoken honestly. He said that although I had been married five times, the man I was currently living with was not my husband. I blushed and looked at the ground and prepared for the usual blast of hateful words. As we approached Jacob's well, I found myself looking up at Mount Gerizim, and it made me despise the Samaritans even more. Instead of worshiping at the Lord's holy temple in Jerusalem, these ungodly Samaritans chose to practice their half-truth religion on top of this mountain. I felt that God be supposed to. No man in Sychar knew exactly how many husbands I had been married to. How did this man know? Embarrassed and ashamed, I waited for the scathing words with my head bowed. But none came. When I looked up, I saw only kindness and compassion in his eyes. Who was this man? I nervously started talking just to fill the empty space. When I said that I believed that Messiah was coming and that he would tell us all things, Jesus very simply told me that I needn't look any longer. He was the Messiah, the Christ. I'll never forget that moment for as long as I live because suddenly I understood and believed. He was the living water. I couldn't speak. I couldn't breathe. As my eyes filled with tears, all I could do was fall to my knees and drink in the living water of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world.
time. Judas, kiss at me. Peter, do something. Get that woman out of there. I saw the condemning looks in their eyes, but Jesus' manner towards me didn't change. He looked at me with kindness and forgiveness. The people of Sychar had to know about Jesus, that the Messiah had come. So I ran into the city to tell them they had to meet Jesus. I was greatly re relieved when Rebecca ran off. I hope we seen the last of her. When we offered Jesus some food, he told us that he eaten some food we didn't know about. While we were trying to figure out what he meant, Jesus pointed to the distance and told us to lift up our eyes and look at the fields that were ready to harvest. I looked where Jesus was pointing and <laughs> all I saw was trouble. Rebecca was leading a group of excited Samaritans straight toward us. What a wonderful time we had. All of us except Jesus' disciples, that is. Peter refused to even call me by my name. Many of the townspeople believed and drank of the living water as I did. Jesus' teaching, his presence, was so life-giving. We begged him to stay longer, but Jesus said he had to go and share the message with others. The time passed so quickly. It seemed like we were in sidecar for an eternity. But finally, we set up for Galilee. Those days when we were alone with Jesus were the most precious to me. Just walking to get on the road, listen to him teach, ask him any questions we wanted. I didn't realize what a privilege it was. I was a new person, free from my dark past and full of faith in my Messiah. There were still those that rejected me, but I knew Jesus had forgiven and accepted me and that was all that mattered. Over the months, I was so thirsty for the truth. I found myself constantly dreaming of sitting at Jesus' feet and drinking in his teaching. I had so many questions that I wanted to ask him, but I didn't know where to find him. When would he reveal to everyone that he was the Messiah? When would he set up his kingdom? Then Sarah, a friend of mine, told me that her brother had seen Jesus and his disciples on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. We both had the same idea and left immediately for Jerusalem. What exciting days we experienced with the Master. He performed so many unbelievable miracles, healing hundreds of people, raising the dead, feeding thousands with less food than one person would eat. And when we arrived in Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover, Everyone was talking about Jesus. The crowds were looking for their Messiah, and we were all ready to crown him king. When we got to Jerusalem, it was the first day of the week, and the city was overflowing. I soon discovered that I wasn't the only one looking for Jesus. As we drew near to the Mount of Olives, I heard shouting, and suddenly there he was, descending the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey. To my surprise, the vast crowd was echoing the same emotion that was in my heart. And I couldn't help but join them as they cried out, Lord, save us! Save us now! Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest!
decided to return to the temple, and he wasn't pleased with what he saw. The temple grounds looked like a marketplace. He went straight for all those who were buying and selling, and tipped over all of their tables. What a mess he made. Coins rolling all over the floor, doves flying everywhere, and all the merchants were running away from this madman who acted with such authority. The priests and scribes were watching Jesus with their usual hatred, but I was sure the common people of Jerusalem were on our side. Finding Jesus turned out to be harder than I thought it would be. We heard that he had gone to the temple, but we certainly wouldn't be welcome there. To make matters worse, as Passover got closer, people kept pouring into the city. Going anywhere was becoming more and more difficult. Why was Jesus wasting time? Why did he, didn't he just declare himself to be the Messiah and go ahead and set up his kingdom. The crowds were ready. By Thursday, we still hadn't seen Jesus, and I could hardly bear it. I had so many questions I wanted to ask him. Whenever the Pharisees or Sadducees came to see Jesus, came to Jesus with one of the trick questions, he easily beat them at their own game. They always left soundly defeated, but their hatred was growing by the minute. We needed to move quickly. Most of all, I just wanted to be with the Messiah, to worship Him, the one who had given me such forgiveness and peace. By the time our Passover meal was done, I knew something was terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not Himself. Then, He took us to Gethsemane, where He agonized in prayer, and it was there that Judas came and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Every disciple fled and deserted the Master, but my shame is the greatest. Three times I said that I never knew him. On Friday, mid-morning, an upset woman came running into the inn where we were staying and told the owner's wife that she had just seen Jesus. Excitedly, I asked where he was. With a trembling voice, she told me that he had been taken a short distance outside the city walls to somewhere called the Place of the Skull. A shudder of fear ran through me, and then... I heard her say, crucified. I couldn't go to the cross and face Jesus. When he needed me most, I ran away. Three times I told people that I did not know him, just like he said I would. 
I had even gotten angry with Jesus and had told him I would die with him. Never, never would I deny him, but he knew, and now I would never be able to ask his forgiveness. Forever, I'll be Peter, the rock, the coward, the traitor. As Sarah and I made our way to the place of the skull, I found myself praying that the Jesus on the cross was a different Jesus than the man I had met in Sychar. After all, Jesus was a fairly common name. As we drew closer, I could see not one cross, but three. We stood at the back of the small crowd ga gathered there, but it took a moment before I had the courage to look up. The two men on the outer crosses did not resemble the Jesus that I had remembered, and the man on the middle cross was beaten beyond recognition. My hopes began to soar until I noticed two people standing at the foot of the middle cross. One was a man named John who was with Jesus in Sychar. The other was a woman who was crying and struggling to remain standing. John was supporting her and keeping her from falling to the ground with grief. When she looked up at the cross, I let out a cry, for in that moment I saw the resemblance and knew who she was, the mother of Jesus. I could feel the darkness closing in on me as I fell to the ground, weeping. I know you've enjoyed thus far what we've uh, witnessed. I want to take a little break. I want to take an offering. And I want you to know that uh, we don't charge for these, pr these productions. This is not an admission fee. Here at Bethel, we believe that uh, the Lord's work is supported by the free will offerings of God's people. And so if you have it in your heart to give to the work of the Lord here, you'll have that opportunity to do so in just a moment. Uh, first of all, as our ushers come, I want us to take a moment and look to the Lord in a word of prayer and thanksgiving to Him for all that He has given to us. Our dear Father in Heaven, we're just thankful as we witnessed uh, this part of the program and we're reminded of the great uh, Savior that we have, the Lord Jesus. And we recognize that everything that we are and all that we have is because of Him. So Lord, as we give back to you this afternoon, we do so out of hearts that are overflowing with great thankfulness to you. We praise you. We enter into the praise of this time, not only by singing, but also by giving of uh, what you have first given to us. Do take these monies and give wisdom in the distribution of it that we might uh, glorify you even in that. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
forget that horrible day. While Jesus was dying on that cross, I fled to a deserted place and cried out to the heavens, begging Jesus' forgiveness, knowing he was gone forever. Then darkness fell over everything, and the ground began shaking violently, people screaming everywhere. It was like God was angry with what he saw on earth. Why didn't God do something to stop it? Crucifixion went on and on. I had thought I was forgiven, but the old familiar guilt of my wicked past made me feel like I was drowning. Suddenly, a familiar voice grabbed my attention, and I realized it was coming from the cross. Faintly, I heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Could he still forgive my sin? Eventually, I laid aside my self-pity long enough to try to find some of my fellow disciples. They were hiding in the shadows all over the city, just as dis disillusioned as I was. But they had not sinned against the Master as I had sinned, and they would never know my dark secret. When Sarah and I got back to our room, I fell into my bed exhausted. Whenever I closed my eyes, one of two visions came to life. By far the most vivid was Jesus, struggling to breathe, with blood, blood everywhere, streaking down his body, running down the cross, dripping into the dirt. The other vision was that of a Passover sacrifice that I hadn't thought about in years. When I was eight years old, my father bought home, brought home a baby lamb, and I raised it as my own. After that little lamb was a year old, we traveled to the top of Mount Gerizim for the Passover, and there, to my horror, I watched as the priest slit its throat and the blood poured out of my lamb's lifeless body. What was I supposed to do now? Go home to Galilee to be laughed at? I was so confused and scared. What if the soldiers came after me next? <laughs> Why would they even bother with a coward like me? I hardly slept Friday night and I felt miserable when I got up on Saturday morning. Since we were almost out of money, we decided to head back on Sunday. I was dreading the long trip home. We went to bed early on Saturday night. We got up well before dawn, packed our few things, and started the long trip back home. It was time to face reality. Jesus was dead, and he was not going to conquer the Romans and set up his kingdom. It was a good dream while it lasted, but now it was time to wake up. I was a fisherman, and I had a family to provide for. It was time to get back to many nets and catching fish. Early Sunday morning, as Sarah and I were trudging out of Jerusalem, the crucifixion kept replaying in my thoughts, and it didn't make any sense. Just before Jesus died, he cried out, It is finished! But it didn't sound like the dying gasp of a defeated man. It sounded more like a shout of victory. When Sarah and I got outside of the city walls, something strange stopped us in our tracks. Very faintly in the distance, we heard women's voices shouting, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Suddenly, almost like a dream, two women appeared before us, running through the morning mist, and I recognized them immediately. They had been standing near the cross. As tears of joy streamed down their faces, they called out, Hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. Jesus is risen. Alone, running from a shattered dream, always hiding from a past I can forget. He came. Whisper 
promise. The mouth of God soon begins to overwhelm me with a song. There flows a mighty fountain to wash away all sin. Oh, taste the living water and never thirst again. Alleluia, alleluia. Jesus Christ is risen, now let the song begin. Alleluia, Alleluia. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. Christ is risen. Alleluia, Alleluia. Jesus Christ is risen, now let the sun begin. Alleluia, Alleluia. Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. He is risen. Alleluia. I was the first apostle to see Jesus alive. The next 40 days were filled with blessing as Jesus opened our eyes to the wonders of his death, burial, and resurrection, and in his great mercy, Jesus forgave me and restored me. Jesus was alive and I was forgiven. Sarah and I wanted to stay in Jerusalem to learn more, but we were out of money. So we continued on our way to Sychar, overflowing with joy. When we arrived home, we told everyone what had happened, and many more Samaritans became followers of Christ. Just before Jesus ascended to his Father in heaven, he told us to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. But when he said to be witnesses in Samaria, my mind immediately snapped back to that day at Jacob's well. I had treated Rebecca so badly, and I silently prayed that someday I would be able to make it right. Our little band of believers was enjoying wonderful times of prayer and fellowship, but we needed instruction. I was the one who knew most about Jesus, but I knew so little. We began to pray that God would send someone who could answer our questions. When we heard that the city of Samaria, Samaria had received the word of God, the apostles sent John and me to help establish the church and provide direction. After we were finished there, we decided to visit other Samaritan cities to preach the gospel and be of hope where we could. One evening, I went to the, to the home of a friend where our small group was gathering for prayer. When I walked into the house, my mouth dropped open. I found myself standing face to face with Peter. He was so different from the Peter that I remembered. The last time we had met, he had treated me like the mud on the bottom of his sandals. Now he treated me like a dear sister. But the thing that amazed me the most was there was something in his manner that reminded me of Jesus. Rebecca and her friends were so full of questions. John and I met with them late into the night. Rebecca still harbored a lot of bitterness toward, toward those who crucified Jesus. But when I explained that Jesus had come from heaven to die, to be the final Passover lamb for all of us, even those who crucify him, she seemed to understand that we, uh, that we needed to pray for them too, even for the soldiers who drove the nails into his hands. The evening ended much too soon, but our faith was greatly strengthened. Both Peter and John told us of all Jesus had taught them after the resurrection, and I finally understood what was really going on at the cross. Jesus loved me so much that he sacrificed his own blood to cleanse me from my sin. As people were leaving, I asked Rebecca if I could speak to her for a moment. When I saw the fear in her eyes, I smiled and told her that I was the one who should be afraid. Then the words that I had wanted to say for so long began to tumble out. 
First, I asked her to forgive me for treating her so badly. I told her that I was the wicked one, not her. With tears, I told her of my three denials and how Jesus had forgiven me, and that now I was begging for her forgiveness also. I was speechless. No one had ever asked me to forgive them for anything. After a few moments of awkward silence, I blurted out, Who am I to grant forgiveness? Of course, of course I forgive you. I smiled and thanked her over and over again. Her great kindness truly humbled me. The next morning, John and I were on our way back to Jerusalem, and I was thanking God for allowing me to see Rebecca one more time. Peter's apology had a profound effect on me. He assured me that just as Christ had forgiven Peter, Christ had also forgiven me. I was accepted and loved by God. Jesus offered me a drink of living water, and oh, I drank deeply. The living water of the gospel is not just available to a few special people. It's available to everyone, of every race and every language, no matter how sinful or how righteous we think we are. And he still offers himself to all who are thirsty. Come, come drink of the living water of Christ. If all of you can stand, we're going to sing together, Come Drink from the Well. I know you enjoyed that immensely, as I did also. A lot of work went into this, and this is kind of uh, uh, just a, our Christmas program got canceled because of uh, the situation, and so we are glad that we had this opportunity today. Very meaningful, uh, reminded us again of how much we owe the Lord Jesus. And I, we prayed, and I know that, that everyone has been praying that this would really minister to our hearts and that it just wouldn't be a performance. I want to thank, however, everyone that had uh, a part in this. Uh, I'm thankful for uh, the props and the, uh, the lighting, uh, the sound system that was uh, put uh, together for this, for all of those that participated both in the choir as well as in the narration. And uh, I'm especially thankful for uh, our sister in the Lord, for uh, Anastasia, and for the hard work that she put into that. We want you to come. Mrs. Bickle has something to do. Did you want to say something? All right, all the, you, you want all the choir or just the girls? Okay. All right, round of applause. Okay, let's close in a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for today. Thank you for all the practice and uh, all that went into making this a very blessed time this afternoon. 
We thank you, Lord, for uh, the message of the gospel that was clearly communicated. We thank you most of all, Lord Jesus, for who you are, for your greatness, for your goodness, for your willingness and your love to sacrifice your life and pour out your lifeblood so that we might have complete and full forgiveness of sin and be the recipients of life eternal. Lord, our hearts are just full of thanksgiving. And I do pray that we would take the, the message that it would not only be ringing in our ears, but that it would be a sweet melody that would continue to ring in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts, and that it would result in what you desire to accomplish in every single one of our lives as we say yes to you as we receive you and your, your sacrifice that offers us forgiveness and life. And again, Lord, all praise, honor, glory to you alone. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.